Thank you, Matt. Um, it's really great to be here this afternoon with you. Um, spatial and temporal heterogeneity are important character characteristics of all ecosystems, affecting to varying degrees community structure, species diversity patterns, and ecosystem function. Um, for many, uh, this variability is really driven by climate, as seen here. <clears throat> What we have is uh, the Palmer Drought Severity Index, which includes kind of temperature, precipitation, going back 100 years in each of these locations across the United States. And one thing that really stands out is that there's a great deal of both spatial and temporal uh, variation. And, um, and with current concerns about human-induced uh, yeah, human changes in climate and habitat modifications, uh, we have seen um, an increasing focus on the effects of this kind of variation in natural ecosystems. Freshwater communities are among the most sensitive to environmental variation. Uh, and this is especially true for temporary aquatic ecosystems, which are usually directly tied to uh, precipitation and temperature patterns. Um, now, these, um, these kinds of systems are ubiquitous on a global scale, and they are discrete and dynamic in both space and time, and therefore, um, they're really model systems to address questions related to uh, climate variation. Temporary uh, waters also have a number of other characteristics, and this includes the system that I work in, California Vernal Pools, where um, they, are, they tend to be a greatly reduced habitat. Um, they provide a number of ecosystem services, including ground, groundwater recharge, flood control, nutrient recycling, and they have disproportionately high levels of uh, species diversity and endemism. And finally, by definition, of course, they have a consistent dry phase. So they fill and dry on some consistent, on some kind of cycle. And, um, and so this uh, inundation desiccation cycle results in these different habitat types occurring in a single location. Um, habitat types or phases, if you will. And so uh, vernal pools have these three phases. The, uh, of course, we have our uh, Mediterranean climate with um, cool, wet winters. And uh, that's when we get the, the aquatic phase during the winter time and uh, typical aquatic community. And as we head into springtime with the precipitation decreasing and temperature increasing, uh, we have increased evaporation and those aquatic uh, communities are then replaced by a terrestrial community, and that's where we get the showy wildflower displays um, vernal pools are well known for. And most of the year, though, it looks like this, where there's not a whole lot of above-ground action going on, but um, you do see a great deal of thatch, plant thatch, from that terrestrial phase. So store that in your, in your brain, because we're going to come back to that later. So the predominant factor that influences these kinds of systems, including California vernal pools, is hydro period, which is the length of time that the system is inundated. And there's been decades and decades of research um, in these kinds of systems on this, and um, this is well known to be kind of the factor affecting these communities. And if you look at all the, the kind of research over the years, there are two things that, that stand out. Uh, the first being that uh, hydro period uh, greatly affects species composition, species richness, as well as ecosystem functioning. And that's true for the, whoops, ah, that's true for the, um, the aquatic, oh, this laser pointer is pretty weak. Um, so it's true for the aquatic phase, and it's true for the terrestrial phase, that, that hydro period uh, will influence both of, the, both of those phases. The second point that stands out is that the aquatic and terrestrial phases or habitats in that vernal pool, they tend to be studied separately. Uh, people look at hydro 
hydro period effects on the aquatic community, or people are studying the hydro period effects on that terrestrial phase. And it's kind of a, a situation of never the twain shall meet. And so uh, we have kind of this rift between how we study these kinds of systems. This is not only this is true for vernal pools, but also seasonal wetlands in general. So the question I've been interested in for the past few years is this question, do these phases affect each other through time? So looking at it through this sort of temp lens of, of kind of the, the temporal axis. And uh, in other words, you know, do the dynamics of one phase influence the other phase? So do the dynamics or the species composition, bless you, um, the, uh, or movement of organisms, do they influence each other uh, through time? And, um, and so the question is, okay, so how, how can we kind of approach this question of, um, of looking at how aquatic and terrestrial habitats uh, influence each other? And one obvious um, direction to go to is, is look at the um, spatial subsidy literature, so that where um, we have um, um, these aquatic and terrestrial linkages in space, where subsidies are the movement of, kind of organisms and materials across ecosystem boundaries, and most commonly across that aquatic terrestrial boundary. And you can have, uh, of course, you know, resources moving um, between the two ecosystems, prey, um, habitat structure, uh, as well as predators that can greatly uh, influence um, both, both of those um, habitats. So we can go back to vernal pools and kind of think about these linkages. Um, um, first, looking at it uh, from a spatial context, uh, that, um, that you can have this interaction with the terrestrial habitat in space through um, insect dispersal or overposition, or um, you can also have it through nutrient runoff uh, from adjacent habitat. Uh, but what's been less studied has been this potential for the aquatic and terrestrial habitat to interact in time. Um, and, uh, and it's kind of um, analogous or pretty similar to um, legacy effects, which are um, the term used for uh, people who study desert ecosystems that um, you know, uh, that address this question of how past conditions affect present conditions. And so uh, it's very similar to that. You can have this aquatic terrestrial divide occurring within a year, and you can have it across years as well. In my lab, we've, we've um, documented some of these effects, um, especially during the aquatic phase where you um, where if you have eutrophication, you end up with an increase in these algal mats that um, then create this algal crust that suppresses that plant community um, upon desiccation. But then there's also the potential of interaction and time with that thatch during that terrestrial phase influencing the aquatic phase once they re-inundate. So this leads me to this question I was interested in about this, the study I'm, I'm going to talk about today is the question was, does hydroperiod interact with spatial and temporal linkages? Spatial being nutrients, kind of um, mimicking kind of runoff of nutrients into the aquatic environment, and the temporal linkage being thatch from that previous year. And so does hydroperiod mediate these interactions? Does it influence it? Um, and how does that play out in both the aquatic phase and the terrestrial phase within a given year? So um, this was a mesocosm experiment um, done and where we manipulated um, hydro period and short and long hydro period. We had um, control and addition of nutrients and um, thatch control and addition. This is a little schematic of um, kind of the design, the timeline of the study, um, where they were inundated in December, and for the long hydro periods, they stayed inundated until May. 
Um, and then we had uh, short hydro periods, which were inundated for nine weeks, dried out, stayed dry for two weeks, and then re-inundated. And, um, um, and so we have the aquatic phase and then the terrestrial phase at the end. And for, day, for today's talk, I'm really going to talk about um, results from this latter part um, of this experiment. And what was measured, at least what I'm going to present today, were the aquatic invertebrates, so for the, both the passive and active dispersers, passive being the species that are emerging uh, from the soil, from the cysts, and active dispersers being uh, the insects that are either dispersing into um, the mesocosms or those that are ovipositing into it. Um, also during that aquatic phase, the um, algal mats. And then upon drying, uh, we measured uh, plant richness. At least I'm presenting plant richness. Okay, so you're going to see a series of uh, figures like this. Uh, along the x-axis, we have short and long hydro period. And then um, the, uh, the, the figures on the, on the left are control for nutrients on the right, um, nutrient addition. The white bars are control for thatch, and then the green bars have thatch added to them. So this is for the passive species richness. So these are, you know, fairy shrimp, tadpole shrimp, and copepods, and so on. And what I found was that, um, of course, species richness increased with um, hydro period, um, but decreased with litter addition. And that's not too surprising. There have been a number of studies have shown that that cis uh, emergence, breaking that, that dormancy, it can be sensitive to light. Uh, and we got these um, three-way interactions between hydroperiod, litter, and nutrients, where there wasn't whoops, there wasn't much effect um, with nutrient addition of the litter. And this is just showing the three of the four endemics. Um, uh, Branconecta lynchii, Lepidurus packardi, and Zizicus californicus, just illustrating their patterns of, over time, and they were really hit hard by the, um, the litter addition, which is the lower graphs. You can see that they, um, their abundance declined, was much lower, and their um, the length of time they were in there was shorter. Now, for the active species richness, these are all the insects coming in, you know, dragonflies, amsoflies, mosquitoes, coronamids, and so on. They showed the exact opposite pattern that the passive um, species exhibited, where they had higher abundance in the shorter uh, hydroperiod treatments, and they, their abundances increased with litter addition. And, um, and so you've got this hydroperiod by litter interaction as well. Very interesting results. Now, for the algal mats, um, this gets a little bit hairy, so hold on. Uh, so what happens is, so algal mats, they declined with increasing hydro period. Um, so if you compare the short and long, they, they declined. And that was mostly due to the fact that, that in long hydro period treatments, these longer-lived species like the tadpole shrimp and the, the clam shrimp were able to um, sustain, have populations, and those are well-known um, bioturbators. And so you can see down below the long hydro period, those are ex pictures of ex examples of those mesocosms where they're just in, in very, very turbid. And so you didn't have that algal mat kind of um, establishment. And then, um, and then in the short hydro period with nutrient addition, that's where they skyrocketed right there. Um, but in the short hydro period without nutrient addition, they um, they you know they seem to be less so. So you get this pattern of, of bioturbidity um, that can exclude the algae, and then um, certain conditions where the algae can just skyrocket. Okay, so upon desiccation, what happens? Well, the terrestrial plants just get hammered by everybody. So um, with hydro period increase, you get a decrease in plant species richness, and this is because of that bioturbidity and that mixing up of the sediment that um, tadpole shrimp and clam shrimp are doing, you get this reduction in plant species richness. And then over here in the short hydro period, 
with nutrients added, that's where you have the algae skyrocketing. And so they're suppressing the plants in, in that treatment. So the greatest richness is when these really short hydro period um, treatments without uh, nutrient addition. But they also are suppressed by litter from that previous year, too. So there's the litter addition, they decline in most of these treatments. So that's illustrating that the year before, the, the, the um, litter that's deposited in the previous year can influence the patterns of diversity in the, the present year. So in conclusion, so hydroperiod interacted with these spatial and temporal uh, subsidies, and they influenced the both the aquatic and terrestrial phases. This is important because what this, this illustrates is that if we look at just um, you know, one slice of, of the vernal pool community, either the aquatic or the terrestrial, without taking into consideration kind of the, the previous dynamics of, of that system, then we're kind of ignoring what may be influencing diversity patterns in, in the present community. And, and and, um, and this kind of little model shows that there's a lot of kind of these complex interactions, direct and indirect, occurring uh, between this hydroperiod nutrients and litter, as well as um, um, uh, species interactions. So in conclusions, you know, again, I just want to highlight this, this point that I think there's a really um, important approach to better understanding seasonal wetlands in general and vernal pools in particular to kind of include not only this hydro period but also how that plays into um, the, these temporal dynamics as well as these interactions with the rest of the landscape. And this is especially true for um, for management and restoration um, to kind of take in this habitat holistically and look at how these different phases interact with each other um, and, and, um, and some future directions for this kind of work is to, um, uh, you know, this was a mesocosm study, was to take it out into the field. Uh, I've been working with Sharon Collins from uh, University of Colorado. Um, and we've been uh, documenting some of these patterns in the field as well. And some of the uh, data I didn't show today was a lot of the kind of ecosystem functioning stuff, like decomposition and production and stuff. And it would be interesting to um, um, kind of explore the, the relationships between diversity and ecosystem function. And also look at um, how generalizable is this, this pattern, um, looking at other kinds of seasonal wetlands, um, not only in North America, but throughout the world. And I just want to acknowledge um, funding from Sac State and NSF and all the really great uh, students who uh, participated in this research. And if we have time, I can ask a question. No time. All right. <laughs> well, thank you for listening.